They say that trauma is stored in the body, Mm -hmm. like whether it's in a stiff neck or a tight back or even the inability to even sense pain or pleasure in different parts of your body. And so I started to kind of reconnect with all the different parts of myself so I can move and feel more freely and develop this kind of feminine flow within myself instead of what I feel like most American coaches kind of push is like, you know, power. Right, go, yeah. go, go, go. So a whole bunch of weight and all of this stuff. And so it was a huge transition to me for mm-hmm. me during the period leading up to the 2022 World Championships in Eugene, Oregon. Hi, I'm Ricky Dorez. Welcome to episode 37 of the Mind That Ego podcast. Tori Franklin is an Olympic triple jumper, a public speaker, the author of You Anthem, Stories and Reflections of Celebration, and the founder of the non-profit Live Happy Retreats, which empowers youth through travel, mental wellness, and movement. In 2022, Tori became the first American woman to medal at the World Championships, winning bronze in the triple jump. Her success came a year after performing below her usual standard at the Tokyo Olympics. I was inspired by an article Tori wrote describing how she turned her career around by trusting guidance from the universe and taking a huge leap of faith by moving to Athens, Greece. As you will hear, the spiritual athlete's path to success isn't conventional. Tori shares her path of resilience, overcoming setbacks, sacrifice, and the conviction required to make success a living reality. In less conventional terms, Tori explains how she manages subtle energetics to harmonize mind, body, and spirit in order to perform at peak level from a space of playfulness and joy. Would you like to begin with maybe some some of your story around the journey initially to the Olympics in, in Tokyo and then to the to the medal? If you could guide us through that that journey and we'll, we'll then take it from there. Okay. Um, So the year before the 2021 Olympics, I was training in Chicago uh, with my coach and we had a lot of like great success together. And it's pretty much what got me on the stage and on the level that I'm on now. Um, But I felt like I wanted to be able to push myself a little bit more leading into that Olympics. So I moved. Um, to Europe. I moved to Paris to train for the 2021 Olympics. Mm -hmm. At this point, my spiritual journey was, it was there, but it hadn't quite connected to my body yet. It was more emotional. It was more mental. It was journaling and meditating, of course, but not to the point where my body was starting to have that deeper connection. Mm -hmm. And, um, there were some circumstances that required me to move from Paris. Basically, my coach at the time didn't believe that I was mentally capable of meddling at the Olympics. And so he kicked me out of the mm. team. Yes. And scrambling to find somewhere to go. And I ended up competing like the worst I've ever done in the Tokyo Olympics. It was it was terrible. Mm-hmm. And I really felt like I didn't deserve to be an Olympian. I felt like um, I had failed everybody. I failed myself and I was confused about what was the point of moving across the world to pursue this, this dream if I was going to come out here and jump just so bad. And so after the, that 2021 season, I started the 2022 season and I realized that my career is pretty much going to be over if I don't make a change. That's what was told to me that I was getting up in age and I haven't been performing and I'm also in the triple jump. So it's not exactly a, a premier event that everybody wants to see and pay money to go and watch. So I have to make some changes. Mm-hmm. And that's when I decided to follow my gut and leave the U.S. again and come to Athens, Greece to train. And it was during this process that I really started to connect with my body and just release 
all of the words that I had been carrying around with me, uh, all of the fears, all of the doubts, and allowing my body to become more free. You know, they say that trauma is stored in the body, Mm -hmm. like whether it's in a stiff neck or a tight back or even the inability to even sense pain or pleasure in different parts of your body. And so I started to kind of reconnect with all the different parts of myself so I can move and feel more freely and develop this kind of feminine flow within myself instead of what I feel like most American coaches kind of push is like, you know, power. Right, go, yeah. go, go, go. A whole bunch of weight and all of this stuff. And so it was a huge transition to me for mm-hmm. me during the period leading up to the 2022 World Championships in Eugene, Oregon. Thanks for sharing that. And, and also mm-hmm. this, I'm fascinated by that shift between the idea of embodiment and embodying the feminine Mm-hmm. whilst like how how through that shift how did you then navigate being in that more feminine space and still I imagine you know requiring a lot of self-discipline pushing your body to a degree or to, to you know in a respectable way how did you find that what were the noticeable differences from that traditional approach of the power and then really connecting to your body like what were the big shifts i think one of the huge shifts was mentally just i stopped carrying expectations um i stopped trying to like over exert in a way that wasn't natural to my movement um and like the big thing is like i released expectations um i was like for example if i have a jump session and i was like i just say no stress do your best Mm. and if i do a jump and it's not like technically good i don't think of it as good as good or bad i look at what i did incorrectly what i did correctly and make adjustments Mm -hmm. every time. So then there's never like a bad practice and I'm not leaving a session like, oh, that was a terrible day, you know? It's like, okay, I learned a lot of things from this day. How can I make that different? What can I do to put myself in a better position for the next one? Mm -hmm. Um, And from there, I also developed the mentality, which actually kind of came from my coach, was he's always saying, elefthera, which means free or peso, which means play. Um, so every day, every movement is just free. It's light. It's clean. Mm. Everything's easy. Don't stress. Don't <laughs> put too much in it. You know? We're out here playing. We're out here having fun. We're, we're doing that sport that we love. And we get paid for it. Mm. Just play. Be free. And that released so much stress. Um, and I say I'm releasing this expectation in training and in myself and competition, but that doesn't mean I don't have goals and standards for myself. You know, it's like, it's a fine balance. And you, when you say that with the expectation, like you notice that in your body and in your training, like the the weight lifting through the mind, not putting so much pressure on it. It's a paradox, isn't it? It's almost like the less pressure you put on, the body actually has more freedom to move in a a natural way. Mm -hmm. I really like that. Like how, because what strikes me, and and I, I reached out to you having read your um your content on Medium around around these two events as well, because they were close together. Right, that was it about a year apart. So you yep. had that mm-hmm. failure on that, what perceived failure, what what felt like failure on that stage, mm-hmm. followed by this huge celebration and and accomplishment. Yeah. How did you get yourself? from A to B, I imagine there was a lot of <laughs> soul searching, yeah. but what did it require? And and what, what were you initially, like you said, you felt like you, you didn't belong. What did you initially go through and how did you build yourself back up? Mm-hmm. I went through a lot of 
like a huge spiritual journey during that period. I was reading a lot. I was doing a ton of meditating and I would do like morning affirmations every single morning for like that whole year. Um, I put a lot of effort into figuring out what my routine needed to be to keep myself mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically balanced. Like Mm -hmm. all four had their, their rituals, their routines. Um, and I still do these routines in the morning and I kind of fell off a little bit last year, but I'm getting back on it this year for the Olympics again. Mm -hmm. Uh, so doing, doing these routines is what kind of helped me to build little by little my self-confidence, um, and believing that I, that I, how do I want to put this? That I can achieve success, that I am ready to receive success, and that I want to succeed. That was something that was big. Mm. And I feel like what really stops a lot of people from being successful because they say they want to achieve these things, but in their, their deepest, deepest heart, don't believe that either that they can, that they deserve it or that they're ready for it when they do because of the pressures that come Mm. with being successful. Yeah. And often like in, in spiritual ideas or rhetorics, there can be the belief that success is somehow unspiritual, like striving is somehow unspiritual. Mm -hmm. And yet I'm interested in the experience for you of how did you know in terms of goal chasing and dream chasing, what did that feel like? And just for me, I, I asked that question because the, the, the journey I'm on with, with Mind That Ego and, and writing and all, all the associated things, I just feel compelled to do it. And it's it's hard to put into words why. But I wonder what that was like for you or is like. Clearly you have that, you, you have that focus, you know, you you want that success. But as an inner experience, like how, how does it feel um, to know that? Yeah. Um. So for me, I kind of, receive like these visions whether that's like through a dream or through like maybe intense daydreaming uh or meditation and i'm kind of shown what i'm supposed to be doing Mm. and the route i'm supposed to take and then it's up to me to kind of act on those things but i feel like when you are truly in alignment with what you are supposed to be doing everything falls into place so easily. Like it's almost comical Mm. because like when I was, when I decided to move to Greece, um, my agent, my mom and my family friend were all at the same time, like you need to make a change. And I was Mm. like, yes, I know. (laughs) (laughs) At the same time. And when I reached out to my friend to talk to um, Yorgos Pomaski, the man who's coaching me now, it was easy. He was like, we're going to be here at this time. Come and talk to us. I talked to him and he's like, okay, in 10 days, you move back to Europe. Mm. I'm like, 10 days, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but when I go back home to the US, I find someone to lease my apartment in two days. Uh, my mom is just able to come and help me move my things. The flights are cheap. When I get here, I find an apartment. Two days before I arrived, like everything just lined it, lined up perfectly mm. so that I could be successful in pursuing this dream. And I think that's that's really how it is when you're doing something that you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. That you're meant. Yeah. It's, it's in, what interests me as well is that you had that, that guidance and that feeling of, of everything falling into place, mm-hmm. all, all the green lights, the universe giving green lights along the way. Mm-hmm. but there's that step of prior to that w- were there times where you felt like that just was not happening that it was just red lights that it was a case of 
why is this not working out before you reach that point? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think even on this journey, there have been times where there's been complete setbacks. Uh, Like, for example, when I, I moved to Paris and then was dropped from the team three months before the Olympics. Mm. And I'm why? This is, isn't this what I'm supposed to be doing? And, you know, some people in my corner were like, no, you should have never went there. But I think that was still very much part of the journey. I think there were things that I learned in Paris and not necessarily from training, but from living in another country that made this part of my journey so much easier. Mm. Cause I experienced a lot of like loneliness when I moved for the first time out of the country. And this time I didn't have that same experience because I was more um, like secure in who I am and just spending time with myself. Mm-hmm. And I feel like even when we think experiences are red lights, they're not really, they're just maybe yellow lights put, or yeah. yeah, yeah, but they're telling you something else. Yeah, it's like what you take from those experiences. Mm -hmm. I think there is, like I've had it, like spells of everything seemingly going well and loads of synchronicities and feeling that ease. And then recently, uh, for for a prolonged period of time, just had a spell of like rejection, Mm -hmm. failure, like nothing working out. And I had, like we said, with your, um, you know, you moved to Paris confusion mm-hmm. like actual confusion around I believe in what I'm doing I feel compelled to do it I feel drawn I feel like that's what the universe wants me to do why am I getting rejected why why is this not working out and that that spell it does seem like there's something in almost that archetypal mythological journey of you know you, there are sacrifices to make there are roadblocks, but how do you navigate them? And I like that that way of thinking in terms of orange lights or, or just learning processes driving you through. Like how, because that's a, clearly a, a big sacrifice and, and there are things in life in this pursuit of success. Like you say, you have the dreams, you have the visions that, that can guide. How do you weigh that against other priorities in life other demands like being asked to to travel and go to another country and and the things that you're then leaving behind how do you navigate that tension between the vision and the path and like all the things that don't happen if you (laughs) if you move in one direction then all the things that you're not doing in, in another yes oh that's hard um so after Paris, um, quarantine COVID happened, and during the year and some change of quarantine times, I got to spend a lot more time with my family than I had gotten to spend in like the last four or five years. And during this period, I decided, oh, I want, I like being close to my family. I want to mm. spend time with. Them. And so when the opportunity came was like, oh, you have to go back overseas if you want to continue to pursue this dream. Half of me was like, no brainer, let's go. And the other half was like, but I, I just really, really like spending time with them now and having this realization. I was like, this is something I want to keep. This is something I need. And there was like, it was a pool. It wasn't an easy decision mm-hmm. all the way around. Even though I knew I had to do it if I really wanted to pursue this. Um, so from that standpoint, yeah, I don't have much, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. it's hard, you know, we would, it comes with sacrifices and you just have to kind of find your way around them and find ways where you can still get what you feel like you're sacrificing in a different way. Mm. I think of it as like energy, you know, it's never destroyed. It's just like transferred. It's transmuted. Mm. It's and so even though the energy of me being face to face with my family won't be the same, I can still have those 
that connection that I'm yearning for, whether that's via Zoom calls or finding another community in this place that I'm moving to. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I've done. And I think that's the same for other sacrifices that are made. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it a case of, you know, so deep down that this is what, you, you know, this is what you, you're here to do? That you, yeah. there's a part of you that, work, like, if, if you, how do I articulate this? Like in that move, what, how did you, how did you discern that this, making these sacrifices and making this move is the right thing for me? Because I, I think that on one hand you have the the need for sacrifice, but I think it can also be difficult to know, am I moving in the right direction to make those sacrifices? Right. Was that like a, just a knowing that, that you were just like, this, this is just what I've got to do? I think it was a combination of looking back on my journey mm. and recognizing what the lessons and experiences that I've had in the past, how they have set me up for this very experience, how they have prepared me for this exact move, this exact sacrifice. And that's how I knew it was the right one. Yeah. It like it wasn't something random where it's like, okay, now you have to go and ride a tiger in order to get a medal. <laughs> like for that at all <laughs> i don't know how to do that <laughs> <laughs> but but greece me and my first coach in chicago he's um, a greek american we were coming to greece every summer for three years so i know the culture i know the food i know people here already yeah i moved to paris there for six years that prepared me to live in a country alone so that's making this experience easier i know this is coach's coaching style because of that other coach that I was with. So it's like half of the the battle is is our, I'm prepared for it. Mm. So I, I also knew like that gave me a lot of support and confidence in this decision. I wonder what, what your relationship is to destiny. Yeah, and this, Ooh. yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. What's your relationship to <laughs> destiny? <laughs> I just really like that question. I ask people that question all the time. Like, what mm. do you think about this? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like, it's very much paradoxical to me because I feel like um, we each have a, a like purpose. We each have a destiny, um, but it's something that we create as we go. And there there is a big life mission that we are hopefully if we come into our true selves and our remembering can achieve. Um, but as we go through life and make every little decision that we make, it leads us exactly to where we are supposed to be, where we were going to end up. Mm -hmm. So to make these choices, whether to buy an Android or an iPhone <laughs> or whatever, but Either decision that we make is going to lead us to where we're supposed to be. And it may not even be the same one, but that's the one we were always going to make. And that's the place we were always supposed to go. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Because uh, I, I often reflect on what you're, you know, what you're articulating compared to the idea of potential. It's like actualizing a potential. Mm -hmm. free will is a big one when it comes to to destiny mm -hmm. i wonder if like the underlying again the mythological archetypal arc would lead you to some place but the circumstances that like orbit that it depend on those decisions almost like there's a like you have free will but it's within yeah. the, the confines of this like labyrinth of destiny mm -hmm. that there are similarities. Like what well, you watch it in like sci-fi films, like you you might there might be a parallel universe where you do the long jump. <laughs> you right. know, like this where, where it's just like these decisions, the circumstances that there is variation in, but the actual underlying, like you say, that the true life's calling. Mm -hmm. It is there, and then life, it, yeah, just gravitates around that. That's 
that's just me kind of sharing my existential <laughs> uh, thoughts on that. Yeah. It's like we we're sitting in here in this moment and there are a million different choices and abilities ahead of us. And every time we choose one, there's a million more from that one. And yes, so I kind of, yeah. that, and it's just like, yeah. Leading you to your destiny. Yeah. And yeah, like, a, like you say, one choice is made and there's a, an infinite amount of then choices based on past decisions. Mm hmm and it is constantly like the synchronicities, the signs are nudging you in those directions. I think of it also, I guess a, a good, a good a comparison is the nature of dreams and how they often represent like an underlying insight or an underlying psychological, emotional truth, mm. but might on the surface just appear completely random and it's like you might have a dream of someone that you know and they might it might actually be about someone that you know or they might represent in that dream just the archetype of like what their energy brings up in you they're representing so i wonder if there's that through that manifestation mm -hmm. i don't know if you're interested in it much in like the because i had a conversation around chaos theory I don't know if you're familiar with this the like the uh idea of this is so it's from it's like a, a mathematical model around behind all seeming chaos there's order mm -hmm. and it just depends how you observe that and and eventually you will see that there's order and you can look at like the fibonacci sequences in in nature and all this kind of incredible stuff yeah. and i wonder if there's that also that element around the chaos of life and it sounds like you're in tune with that like there, there's an apparent chaos in life but it does have that order it does have that that streak of, of destiny yeah i yeah. agree i think that's how i pretty much try to like look at circumstances or situations that you know don't feel great or don't go your way and realize okay there's a re there's something I was supposed to learn here, or mm. there was a decision I was supposed to make and didn't. And how can I do that differently? How can I get off of this little cycle and and up on a more positive one mm -hmm. and keep making my word? Yeah, that's a nice way of looking at it as well. Like basing mm -hmm. decisions also on like being more loving, being more compassionate, not just circumstantially practical, but how can I make decisions that are, are aligned to that? um yeah so I wonder I'm, I'm interested in going back to, to like your relationship to your body and and to this shift mm -hmm. talk about re you know reading messages from the universe how do you connect and and listen to your body in a way where you know be it with diet uh, you know what you're eating particularly when you're training you mentioned not pushing your body too far for what what it's it's um is comfortable for it as what well is natural for it. Yeah. How do you tune in and know I'm pushing myself too hard? Right, because you know this this idea of your body's got so much more than you think, like in the tank when you're on a run when you're doing something. Yeah. How, how do you discern that um, mm -hmm. that process? Yeah, um, I think. So for me, I what I tend to do during training is I like I like to shake or move or dance just to like really make sure I'm feeling everything and get like really loose and connected, even to like my fingertips, mm. my toes, neck, and I pull out my ears. Mm -hmm. I move, <laughs> you know, <I'm> moving small. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just like. Sometimes even when I'm feeling pain, like the, in 2022, I had a recurring knee issue, like knee pain. And I used my mind and of course, treatment to tell my body, 
diabetes is healthy. Every morning I said, my body is healthy. Mm. My mind and spirit moves in perfect synchronicity because if my body is moving together, then nothing is hurt because every, everything is doing the work it's supposed to do. Mm. My body hurts when something is taking on more because there's a, a weakness or something, say in my, my gluteus minimus or something, now my mm. hamstring hurts. So I'm telling my body, no, glute, you need to pull your weight, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it needs to work. <laughs> and I think when you can get like this connected to your body to get everything activated and like we're a team, guys, you know, mm. then you're able to really push without causing an imbalance or pain to your body. Yeah. Because it's true. Your body can do like so much more. Your mind's exhausted and your body can do more. But you have to get to the point when your mind is so in sync with your body that it can tell your body, like, this is what we're doing. This is how we're doing it so that it's healthy and efficient for us. Mm. Then you jump to the moon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you're harmonizing, harmonizing mm-hmm. both body and mind. Do you feel that? How do I, how do I articulate what I'm trying? Mm-hmm. Like the the body itself in relationship to the mind. Like how how do you detect? Because you know you have that mind to body. Okay, like we're a team. Clearly a a guiding and compassionate way of relating. Mm -hmm. Do you receive messages from your body as well? Like the reason I say that is I've noticed in going through stressful periods, like how I have to be like relax. And then it's almost like a body's like, oh, thanks. And it starts sending, it almost like the body's then sending positive signals. So I wonder as well if you have that in terms of sensation, if you if you notice that the body is also sending those signals. Yes, all the time. And I'm very like cognizant of these things, especially like whether it's in training or in like a triggering experience or something, I can feel like, okay, my root chakra it just tightened up. Something mm. you said really triggered me right there. Mm-hmm. And I can explore it and see what my body needs from me. Like whether it's a verbal affirmation, whether it's water or just take space or to mm. meditate, um, I get those often. Um, and it's very subtle. And if you're too focused on external things or don't have that same connection, it's hard to recognize like if you're feeling a little tense in your throat or feeling just like your shoulders start to hunch up when you're you know around somebody or something mm. like that or electricity. And being able to be so aware in the moment, so present in the moment that you recognize what did it. Yeah, you can almost see the chain of events through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've I've noticed that through through anxiety, and that has been a big process for me working with anxiety, navigating it, showing up with it worrying like am I going all these these processes um and I noticed that it doesn't happen all the time but I was going through a a spell of a lot of stress and then if I was in a a situation that would cause anxiety my body would actually start shaking which is like some kind of trauma response yeah but I would start paying really close attention to it and I had to initially accept I just be with it I'm like if I'm shaking I'm shaking I had to really just accept it people see that I'm shaking that's fine like if I'm shaking I'm shaking and I kind of accept it and then as you described I noticed that if I was really tuned in I could detect the build-up before my body started shaking of just the gradual tension Mm -hmm. and and not even so I'm interested also in 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 your view on um the energetics as well because if i'm right i read you, you practice tantra as well mm-hmm. is that is that correct so you, so you have that that sensitivity to energy mm-hmm. how do, sorry to make it clear between the link because for me i'd realized that it was actually at times excess energy that i wasn't moving through my body 
So the anxiety, yeah. I wasn't moving through. So there was a combination of noticing the tension, noticing my breathing, my breathing would get shallower, that would contribute, and then relaxing mm -hmm. that. And also, like you mentioned, shaking, maybe shaking, dancing, different kind of movement. Mm -hmm. So it was that realization, shake it out. Um, how, on that subject, how do you work with energetics and in particular how that relates to being an athlete and how it relates to the physical body in terms of sure we, clearly we need good sleep we need nutrition you know that's important but for you what role do energetics play in the, the body and in performing at, at such a high level yeah it actually plays a huge role. Um, so first of all, I take it very seriously, like that I cleanse my energetic space, you know, every so often. Um, so I sage myself, I sage my home and clear away all of anything that is not natural to me or any, even if it is natural to me and it's negative, like, get away get away get it off of me <laughs> yes i don't want it um like also the thing the breathing which i've done in training sessions a couple times uh which helps me when i am feeling either anxious or just not connected or stressed about some other life thing and i'm not able to focus on my training I do this kind of ocean breath, which is actually used to regulate your nervous system and just kind of relax you. Mm -hmm. It's typically you during, well, you can really use it whenever. So um, I do this breathing called ocean breath, which really helps to regulate me and keep me grounded. Uh, um, also, I do this kind of, um, it's like a chakra meditation where I kind of open up each chakra mm -hmm. and align them. And that kind of helps my body to kind of be more connected in my mind and my spirit. And I just feel so like cleansed. Mm. And when I, I often use my hands, I don't know, like when I'm practicing and even at competitions, sometimes I'm walking like this and that's me moving the energy up. That's me helping my body to stand tall and releasing anything that isn't mine and any energy mm. that is there, I keep everything flowing up and then I'm ready. And then usually I make at the top just to like bark up everything, get everything yeah. ready and aligned. I also always, I tap on my third eye sometimes to wake up. Tapping helps a lot. Um, and sometimes I call, like I have a couple guides that I trust and use mm -hmm. to give me extra power. And then I'm so strong and fast. And it's, yeah, it's a big part of, of my competition and, and my strength. I wanna go, I wanna go more in depth into that, but first, <laughs> <laughs> how, so for you, like how do you, notice the difference the way that you just define power then in terms of feeding that power calling in your guides like that that energetic mastery compared to what you were taught the more masculine power yes so that masculine power is pretty much all physical it's all like forced it's all mm. trying to down a door instead of finding the key mm. that's yeah. the difference yeah beautifully put mm -hmm. um okay so going down the, the tantra route and mm -hmm. meditation consciousness the body being a expression of consciousness rather yeah. than the the foundation of just isolated human consciousness Mm -hmm. have you noticed and just to like describe my my experience of 
through an awakening experience of feeling like the body is really heavy, burdensome, my mind really trapped in my head, tunnel vision at times, yes. feeling, yeah, not, not really tuned into my body, not really aligned with instinct, mm. in contrast to really feeling in my body and actually noticing my body as part of a expansive experience of sensation of different you know energy and feeling yeah. that um have you noticed through those practices that kind of experience of the body not as like not in its physicality and you mentioned like the energy work within but how, how does that feel like when you when you're really embodied you're in flow you're like, I'm, tra I'm training well today. Like, what is your experience yeah. of your body in that? Oh, so, okay, mentally, it's a little scary. <laughs> 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 because it's like, what is going on? And then all of these synchronicities happen and you're like, okay, this is getting creepy now. Like, it's it's too much. It's too much synchronicity. It's too much positive affirmation it's it's too much everything in alignment like is this real mm, mm -hmm, mm. like and that's when you try to like when you get into like your rational mind and it's like oh no this is weird stuff <laughs> but <laughs> i think when you just really let go and accept it and you know you're in tune with your intuition and your instinct and you're moving and flowing and you're receiving these 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 signs that are telling you to or not do something or even walk down a certain street mm. and it just feels so magical that's really just you just feel so magical and so much love like whenever i'm in that flow because you know it comes and goes depending on whatever happens in life, what I'm focusing on, still human. So I get sidetracked. Um, but when I'm like really in it, I, I feel so grateful and so loved and just so like blissfully happy. Mm. And it, it's amazing. And then as soon as you're like, oh, I don't want this to end, then you'll lose it. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then you, then you desperately try and get it back. So where's it gone? Where's it gone? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um yeah I really, I really like that description thank you I, I wonder if um if you could give some a some, bit of background on a few more of the projects that you're working on and then <laughs> I want to want to then close us but we're on for give maybe another 15 minutes if that's okay with, with you yeah perfect um but just it introduce some of the projects that you're working on and then I'll, I'll ask a closing question which I feel will be really useful for people tuning in awesome so my <laughs> biggest project right now that I'm really excited about is live happy retreats which is my nonprofit. um it focuses on helping inner city kids travel the world to experience different cultures um to get more connected with nature because we're taking we're not taking them to like you know a city like new york or something like that we're, the first place is the dominican republic so mm. we're going into jungle nice. you know barefoot on the ground and waterfalls and all the things to help them get connected to nature recognizing the importance of being a steward of the land mm. uh, and other big components are learning holistic tips and tricks to manage their mental health, um, to get connected to their body through yoga, qigong, breath work, and just to help them really truly recognize their divinity, you know, that, that their purpose on this world is just more, it's more than just working, working away their life or trying to be cool or mm -hmm. not being themselves, not being their authentic self. And that's really like the purpose of it because there are so many kids, especially in the Chicago area where I'm from, 
that live within a couple miles or kilometers from Lake Michigan and have never seen it. Mm. They have never been outside the perimeters of their neighborhood and they've never experienced a life different from their own. And I think a lot of them don't think that they ever will. And that's what I want to show them that their life can be so much grander than they could even imagine. Mm. That's yeah. awesome. That sounds it, awesome. Yeah, I really like that. Uh, this summer, we're doing our first events in Chicago. It's called Live Happy Week. So we'll be doing uh, a couple yoga classes, an entrepreneur event. I will be doing a track camp and a field day, which I'm super excited. It's like potato sack races type stuff, an <laughs> obstacle course. That's that's what I'm I'm really looking forward to that day. <laughs> Three legged races, all that stuff. <laughs> and you egg, egg and spoon race. Is that a, is that a yeah. thing in America? Yeah. <laughs> that's over. Uh, I used to remember that at sports day. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, so that's gonna be this summer in September. Okay, perfect. Like well, mm-hmm. Um so I'd actually, so I, I just want to, you know, I want to share that I've really, really enjoyed talking with you. I've really enjoyed reading your content. I think it can be easy at times to say that people are inspirational, but I genuinely feel you as an inspiration to to many people. I, I really do. Um, and I, I really just wishing you all the best. Where is the Olympics of this year? Yes. Okay, so you're you're in the build up to that now. It's coming up quick. Yes. Yeah. Where where is it this year? It's in Paris. Oh, I was in Paris. Oh, okay. Oh, so well, you were mentioning how different stages of your life. So that's that's mm-hmm. a fitting place for it to be. It's a good sign. Welcome. It's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> um, to so to to bring us to a close, I, I wonder if there are people out there listening that have their own dream that maybe feel am I worthy of it is this going to happen is it worth pursuing what if I fell what guidance would you give someone who has a dream and wants to go after it but they're not sure if that's the right thing to do yeah I would say first to Put yourself in a place of silence, not just environmentally, which you definitely should do, but mentally, emotionally, and physically. Just be silent, silence your mind, and just breathe into yourself, into your body, into your life. And everything you need to know, if you just keep doing this, will come to you. You will be guided and shown the way. And don't be afraid to listen to it. Even if it comes up just like for a split second in your head, like this is what I want to do. And then it's gone. Mm. Little inkling. That will lead you somewhere. And it'll keep leading you somewhere. Yeah. Tori, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. And I, I'm sure people yeah. listening will too. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, an absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. And, and best of luck for your journey to the Olympics as well. Yes, thank you. Yes, go for it. You got it. You got this. (laughs) Thank you for listening to this episode of the Mind That Ego podcast. To stay up to date, you can join the Mind That Ego mailing list. If you head to mindthatego.com slash MFM, you'll also get a copy of my book, Mindsets for Mindfulness, when you join. You can also follow Mind That Ego on Facebook and YouTube, where the podcasts are also displayed in video format, along with other inspired videos that I create. Or if Instagram is more your social media of choice, you can follow me at Ricky underscore Deriz. That's D-E-R-I-S-Z. 